What do you do when you come to a difficult passage in scripture? Like when you see something and you look at it and you're like, man, this is perplexing. I don't know what that means and how it applies to your life. What is your approach? Do you go to the almighty Google? What does 1 Peter 3, 18 to 22 mean? I do that sometimes. What, or maybe do you go to like wise counsel, a brother or sister in Christ who's a bit older in the faith and ask, hey, how have you understood this? Or maybe, maybe you pray over it and say, God, what does this mean? Or maybe you just skip right over it and go move on to what's clear. That's what I did when I taught my very first sermon. Well, I was in student ministry at the time, and my mentor, Brent, he gave me a passage from 1 John 4. And all I knew about 1 John 4 was um, God is love. And I was like, great, I can focus on that. I love God. God is love. This will be a great point for the kids to hear. And then I went and sat down to see what exactly what passage I was looking at. And I get the first three verses, the testing of the spirits. And I was looking at this utterly perplexed, angels or demons and spirits and testing them. And I, honestly, I came to the conclusion, like, do angels take SATs? Like, I just did not understand what the passage meant and how to apply it. So here's what I did. Skipped right over it, slapped a Jesus band-aid on it. Like, I don't get that, but Jesus, you're going to cover my lack of information. And, and I moved right into what made sense to me. Today, we are going to wade into one of the most perplexing and obscure passages in the entirety of the Bible. And I don't say that lightly. We're going to be looking at 1 Peter 3, 18 to 22. And I've titled this sermon, jokingly, Confused Much? Because this is a very perplexing uh, passage. And I'm not alone in that. As the teaching team has wrestled through this passage, uh, we've really come to different conclusions on what this passage means. And as I went to uh, modern preachers and, and commentators and scholars of today, they're all, they look at this passage and they say, man, I think maybe this is what Peter is saying, but I'm just not quite sure. And so I went back even further. Usually the old dead guys got it right. And so I went back and looked at what does Martin Luther have to say? Martin Luther was a Protestant reformer, a great theological mind. He has some theological chops. And here's what he had to say. A wonderful text is this. And a more obscure passage, perhaps, than any other in the New Testament, so that I do not know for a certainty what Peter means. Okay, we're not alone, all right? We're going to wade into some wonder today. And I have a couple rules for us, all right? When we get to passages that are unclear, firstly, we're going to focus on what is clear. Ultimately, I chose to continue to teach through this passage because there's such beautiful and epic language about Jesus. And we need to align our view of God with who he says he is. So that's, that's the first rule. When things are unclear, we're going to focus on what is clear. And the second rule is we're going to allow scripture to interpret scripture. So when you come to a passage that's confusing, we're going to look at what does the rest of the Bible have to say about this? Today, specifically, we're going to be looking at two subjects. First, baptism. Second, salvation. And we're going to look at a kind of a quagmire of a verse, and we're going to look at other passages in the Bible that will inform our understanding of what Peter's talking about and what he does not or cannot mean based on the overwhelming majority of the voice about baptism and salvation in the New Testament. So that's where we're going. And I'm hoping today that we can come to God's word as we always should with some humility and childlike faith. And I want to ask us a question that Pastor Craig asked us several months ago. How much mystery can your faith handle? Because we're going to wade into the mystery of God today. So we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're actually going to start in verse 17, but I want to remind us where we've been. Now, Peter, he's writing to elect exiles. These are Christians in Rome who have been scattered among the Roman provinces. And they find themselves under a sadistic dictator named Nero, who hated Christians, gave them a terrible reputation as cannibals because they took communion, as incestuous because they say, I love you, brother. I love you, sister. And, and so they, they had a terrible reputation. But more than that, they were blamed for massive fires that took place in Rome that more than likely Nero himself instigated. On top of that, they're being uh, burned in Nero's gardens to light up the way, and, and they're being fed to wild animals. And so this is a time of extreme persecution for the church. Nero is trying to squash the movement of Jesus. And in chapter one, 
he reminds them, Peter does, of the hope they have in Christ. He says, I know the circumstances, the suffering, the persecution, look to Jesus. He is your living hope. And then over the next couple chapters, he, he tells them how to live according to that hope. He says, look, be holy like God is holy. The gospel call is to live holy. And that hope-filled thinking of your living hope fuels holy living. And then he, he references specific instances in which they will find themselves and their call to holiness still stands there, specifically with their uh, relationship to the government. Yes, Nero, they're called to live holy and righteous in that relationship. In their relationship between slaves and masters, something like uh, 25% of Peter's audience may have been slaves, some, some commentators kind of estimate. And then he talks about what holiness and righteous gospel living looks like as a wife that has an unbelieving husband and as a husband who's called to honor his wife. And so he's slowly walking these people through, what does this actually look like to live out the gospel in the midst of your suffering, in the midst of your persecution? And last week, Pastor Jeremy walked us through the blessing of God that is on his people when they are treated with evil and they return that treatment with blessing that God's face and eyes are upon them. And so that's where we've been so far. And we're gonna continue, verse 17. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Why? Verse 18 answers. For Christ also suffered. That word also right there, I think for the original audience would have been so profound. In the midst of their sufferings, it's understandable that they might be asking the question, is God against us? Like, has God abandoned us? And Peter says, no, in the midst of your sufferings, suffer well. Why? Christ also suffered. God wasn't against Christ. Christ lived a righteous life and he suffered. And your sufferings is like a picture of Christ's sufferings. But Christ's sufferings were different because he suffered once for sins. So he's encouraging them. Look, you have a difficult plight, but the biggest problem in your life has been taken care of the sin that incurs God's wrath. Jesus paid for that once for all. The righteous for the unrighteous. Jesus, the righteous one, he died in our place. Like, let's get, let's level the playing field, okay? At the foot of the cross, the ground is even. All of us, apart from Christ, are unrighteous. We, we deserve wrath in the court of God's economy. And and Jesus, the righteous one, he dies in our place. He took your place on the cross. He took my place. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin, Jesus was perfect, righteous, became sin for us. He, he became sin on the cross and, and the cup of God's wrath was poured out on him and he drank every last drop, which means there is no more wrath for you and I in Christ. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. The righteous died for the unrighteous, that they might be presented to God as righteous, holy, and blameless, robed in Christ. It says that he might bring us to God. That's the aim of Jesus's suffering and death, to bring us to God. The greatest thing we receive in the gospel is not just forgiveness and eternal life and a eternal hope at one point. The greatest thing you and I receive in the gospel is we get God. Jesus brought us to God. And he says he did that by being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. Jesus died on our behalf. His sufferings wasn't just a season of difficulty. Sin required an atoning sacrifice. Jesus did that on our behalf. And in this resurrected state, when he resurrected in the spirit, it says, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. And we're going to do some work on this in a couple of minutes, but I want to put a pin in that because there's a couple, there's a lot of interpretations of this actually. And we're only going to look at two today, but we'll do that in just a moment. So I want you to put a pin in that in your brain. In which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they had formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. So this harkens back to the time of Noah, right? Remember that cute little nursery rhyme? When, when my daughter was little, her nursery was covered in Noah's ark. And uh, looking back on that might have not been the best uh, choice of decor. Like, go, good night, sweetie, sleep tight. And while she's surrounded with by images of God's judgment on the world. But this harkens back to when 
Noah was on the scene and the world was exceedingly evil and people were doing whatever they wanted. No one was honoring God and Noah was building the ark and Noah's ministry as a prophet, as he's building the ark, he was calling people to repent, calling people to come back to God. And people thought of him as the religious nut job. And so he's saying these spirits who are in prison, they're in prison because they disobeyed in the days of Noah. And while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight, persons were brought safely through the water. That last portion of that sentence is so peace-giving to me. And, and I know that may sound weird, but here's the reason why. I tend to value spiritual movements based on how many people show up. That's just a wrestling I have. And maybe you have that too. How many people are at church or how many people come to an event? Here, eight people responded to the grace of God as he gave them instructions on how to be saved from the judgment waters and the rest of the world got it wrong. They didn't respond to God's grace and obedience. And so he says, it's hearkening back to that time where, where things were exceedingly evil. I think if we had a picture into Noah's time, we would be disgusted. And then he says, baptism, which corresponds to this. When he says, which corresponds to this, he's talking about the time of Noah, the ark, the call to repentance, the judgment waters and Noah's family being safely sealed and immersed and surrounded by the ark to go through the judgment. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Now, if you love the gospel, know the gospel, red flags may be coming up in your brain right now. Wait a minute. Nope. Uh Uh-uh, Peter. Jesus is the one who saves us. Now on the surface, that's what this looks like. I'm going to put a pin in this as well. We'll address it later and do some work on it. Baptism, which now corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven. I love this last statement. Verse 22 is epic. Who has gone into heaven is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. This is King Jesus on the throne, sovereign, ruling and reigning. Everything's been subjected to him. And I, what I love about this passage is that we begin with the loving suffering of our Savior. that He died in our place. And we end with this cosmic, awesome, epic, almighty picture of King Jesus on the throne at the right hand of God. And so we're going to comb back through the text. We're going to pull out what's clear and we're going to wrestle with what's not clear by helping other scriptures interpret it, okay? So the first thing that's very clear in the passage, Jesus brought us to God. Let's look at it here. Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. How did he do that? By suffering for sins and by his death. That Jesus' suffering and death had an ultimate aim of bringing you and I to God. This is the gospel that Jesus, the God man, came down, lived the perfect life we're supposed to live. Look, let's just level the playing field. All of us sin. And I'm not saying that we should or we should just not do anything about that. God wants to transform that in us. But the reality is sin is our great issue. And Jesus took care of it. You see, I hear a lot of conversation about Satan being our great enemy. And he is a great enemy of our souls but he's not the greatest enemy you and I have. Our sin is. Satan doesn't separate us from God. Our sin does. That's the deepest need of our life. And Jesus met it here by his suffering and death. The the God man lived the perfect life we're supposed to live. And on the cross, he died the death, uh, taking the wrath that we deserve. And then three days later, he rose from the grave. And in his death, we find forgiveness. And in his resurrection, we find a new life. Jesus conquered sin on the cross. And and in his resurrection, he conquered the grave and he conquered Satan. I think in this moment when Jesus died, the powers of hell are like, finally, we got rid of that guy. Like he just wouldn't stop. And in this moment, when he resurrects, Jesus wins. Jesus overcomes sin, Satan, and the grave. He's the one who brings us to God, not in judgment, but in grace. The word here in the original language for for bring is to present something. Jesus presents you before God in him. He presents you before God robed in his righteousness, robed in his holiness. In Christ, you and I have been brought to God. 
But I'm afraid often it's easy to live as though that's not true. And to, eat, to live as though we have to prove our way to God. We have to gain God's approval by how we live. The other day, I had like a perfect storm of this scenario where I'm getting ready for Easter. Tasks are lining up. Anxiety's like up to my chest. And my kids start arguing. We're at the church and I'm trying to get things done. They start arguing. So anxiety kind of moves up again. And then my wife calls me and she's like, uh, babe, I am, uh, I'm stuck on the side of the road and I ran out of gas, and it, I'm on the side of the freeway, in fact, and I locked the keys in the car, and the ignition's on, so the battery might die, and it's pouring down rain. Now anxiety is up through the roof, okay? And so I tell the kids, I'm trying to keep it under control, hey, can you go get in the car? We got to go rescue mom. And so I go out after they've um, been out at the car for a couple of seconds, and I see that they're arguing about who gets to sit in the front seat, and my youngest has decided she's not going anywhere. She went and sat down in the middle of the church parking lot. And I'm not proud of this, but in the moment, I said, get in the car now. And I made some arbitrary rule that I could never really reinforce. It was just done out of anger. And so we had a silent drive from the church to where my wife was. And during that ride, I felt shame. I felt condemned. I felt in the moment, even looking back on it, like, God, I can't come to you right now. I just proved to you I don't deserve to come to you. I was not living in light of this reality that Jesus is the one who brings me. Even in the worst moments of my life, Christ presents me before God as holy. I'm still robed in his righteousness. And so over the next week, I tried to curry favor in my relationships and my family. Instead of coming before God and repenting and saying, I'm sorry, God, that was sin. And I'm sorry, family, that was sin. You see, it's so easy to not live in the light of this truth, to live as though we have to gain approval before God. We can't. Only Jesus can bring us to God. And any sort of behavior modification like I was living out or any religion attempts to do what only Jesus can do. Only Christ can bring you before God. And in him, you are brought not in judgment, but in grace, robed in his righteousness. So, Are you living as though Jesus is the one who brings you before God? Or are you living as though you have to prove your way to him? The gospel is not clean yourself up and then come to God. The gospel is come to God and he robes you in his righteousness and he cleans you. The second thing I want us to see, Jesus wins. Now we're going to kind of wade into some of the difficult verses here. All right, Um, buckle up. We're going to try and do this together. Jesus wins. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh. Initially, when Jesus is becoming victorious over our sin, when, his, when the work is finished, he says, it is finished. And it doesn't look like winning. <laughs> I think in this moment, the powers of hell are like, yes, we won. We did it. We overthrew him. But then he rises from the grave. And I want to just pause here. The truths that are in this verse. I hope and I pray for all of us. They never become just trite cliches. Yeah, I know the gospel. You know, Jesus died and I get forgiveness. And and I think there's a subtle belief that creeps into the church at times that we can kind of outgrow the gospel, that we need to move on to deeper things than the gospel. Listen, you don't outgrow the gospel. The gospel is how you grow. You don't outgrow it you always will be in dire need of the atoning work of Jesus, you and I both. And so Jesus, he's resurrected. He's victorious over the powers of hell. And now we get to the, to the difficult verses in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Now there's really kind of two interpretations, the broad umbrella interpretations I'm gonna to address today. Uh, and I'm gonna lean into one that I believe is probably accurate. Um, though, I will say up front, great minds disagree on this. On the teaching team, we disagree on interpreting this. And so I'm not making a statement for family church. This is just my honest resting as a child of God, looking at my father's word and trying to understand it. And so this is my interpretation. I encourage you as a family, as a husband and wife, or with a trusted friend, go home and wrestle with this passage yourself. Before the Lord, wrestle together. But There's really two kind of interpretations here. The first is that these spirits are the spirit of people who have passed away, who have died, and that they have become imprisoned because of their disobedience when 
uh, in the days of Noah. That, that Noah's uh, ministry was a call to repentance. It was a call to faith back into uh, following God in a wicked generation. And uh, that those who disobeyed were then imprisoned in a place called Hades awaiting judgment. And I don't hold to this perspective, and here's why. The word here for spirits, pneumata, is almost exclusively, not exclusively, but almost exclusively used of either the Holy Spirit or uh, angelic beings, whether that's godly angels or fallen angels, demons. And so the spirit that I believe he's talking about, this is the second kind of umbrella interpretation, are angelic beings who during the days of Noah disobeyed. And if you look at Genesis 6, there's this really weird, obscure passage that happened in Genesis 6 where the sons of God look down and see that the daughters of men are real cute. And so they have relations with them and, and they have offspring. And there's this weird uh, reality that in some way they're trying to, uh, they're trying to thwart the image of God in humanity. God created people in his image and these fallen angels have relations with, with the daughters of men and they create these offspring that are kind of made in the image of these fallen angels. It was an attempt to thwart God's plan of image bearing and ultimately an attempt to thwart God's plan of redemption. And so think about, this is why I love this interpretation. Think about this. If this is fallen angels, let's just say it is. King Jesus, he's won. He's victorious over the grave, over Satan, over sin. He's resurrected. And he goes to these angels in prison, these fallen angels, these demons. And he's kind of flexing on them, I think. Like I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in this conversation. What did Jesus say there? We don't exactly know, but he's victorious and he's coming triumphant. I wonder, did he say, look, you tried your best to destroy the image of God in, man, in humanity. You tried your best to thwart God's plan of redemption in the world. Guess what? I won. I did it. Je Jesus wins. We're on the winning team, guys. Like we are, we are, he, Jesus is team captain, coach, and all-star. And we're just kind of watching him and marveling at him. Does your theology have room for this Jesus, the Jesus who's triumphant, who wins, right? I think in the church, we often have a picture of Jesus as like this meek and mild, timid guy who one time flipped over some tables and then got real embarrassed about it. So he never did that again. And, 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 I, that's, that's the Jesus over my experience of multiple churches that I've heard. But while Jesus is gentle and lowly and gracious and loving and compassionate, 100% true. Does your theology have room for this Jesus? Does your theology have room for the Jesus of Revelation 19, who has a sword in his mouth, fire in his eyeballs, and a robe dripped in blood? Like, Jesus wins. And I think we need a side adjustment. At least I do. So here's a question I want you to wrestle with. How do you view Jesus? How do you view Jesus? Is Jesus become very small and your problems very big? Every morning when I wake up, I need that side adjustment because I've made Jesus very small and my problems very big. And I need to rearrange my sight and live by faith that says God is on the throne, God wins, and I get to be a part of the winning team today. So how do you view Jesus? Jesus is not just like a male version of Farrah Fawcett with the feathered hair and the cute little lambs. Jesus is the almighty, all-powerful God. And there is nothing, spiritually speaking, that you will come up against. No enemy, no bondage, no sin that he cannot conquer by his power in you. So he resurrects. He won over the grave, over Satan and over sin. And he comes to, I believe, these angels who have been imprisoned. And he proclaims. And I believe he proclaims, I've won. You tried your best to destroy God's plan, we won. And now we're going to kind of work through one of the, the continue, continuing this difficult passage. In verse 20, it says, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water, bringing back to the context, Noah, the ark, the, the uh, salvation through the judgment waters of Noah's family. And it says, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Now, this is a perplexing verse. 
And this is where theologians have been divided for hundreds of years. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take this verse through the principalizing bridge, through the interpretive journey. You guys have seen this graphic probably a couple of times. It is on the back of your outline. If you need to look at it closely, take some notes. That's fine. The first step of interpreting any verse in the Bible is what did this mean in the original context? Well, Peter seems to assume that these people would understand what he's talking about with the spirits who are imprisoned and what it, how that equates to baptism. We don't have that insider information in the Bible. And so if we look at this just at face value, it could be really easy to say, well, it looks like baptism is a part of salvation. Maybe that's what it meant in the original context. So let's run that interpretation through the interpretive journey, I want you to see where it breaks down. All right, so if we start over here and we say the original context, they meant baptism is a required for salvation. Then we look at the, 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 the river between first century Rome, 21st century America. Well, we have the same covenant. We're both in the new covenant, but we have different culture, different language, different situation, different time. And so we take those ideas into account, which don't seem to affect the principle that we've pulled here of baptism as a part of salvation. I want to be very clear. I'm not saying that is what Peter is saying. I'm trying to illustrate that that is not what he's saying by taking that idea through this journey. So if we go to step three then and say, okay, baptism is a part of salvation. That, that's the eternal principle moment where you look at the passage and in a couple statements, you pull out something that's not, not tied to situation, time, time covenant, and you say, baptism now saves you. If that, if that is a part of this passage, we could say baptism is a part of salvation. Now, here's where this begins to break down. Step four, consulting the biblical map. This is where scripture interprets scripture. So we're going to look at a couple of passages in the New Testament that can inform our view of what Peter is saying here. The first one is in Acts 10. Peter himself is preaching. Sermon jam, first century, okay? He's killing it. The Holy Spirit is, is falling on people. Look at this, Acts 10, 44. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come to, with Peter were amazed. So Peter's preaching. The Spirit falls on these people and they're getting saved, the Spirit falls on them and they begin to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. They, they begin to speak in tongues and do all kinds of evidences of God's presence. And the Jews, the circumcised who are there with Peter, are amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. So this is salvation has come into these people's lives. They've repented. They've placed their faith. They've heard the gospel from Peter's sermon. And now they are in the kingdom. And look at Peter's next words. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So Peter says, look, they've experienced salvation. Let's help them in their first step of obedience. Let's dunk them. Let's dunk them. So I don't think in the passage that we're wrestling with, baptism now saves you, that Peter is saying, look, the baptism is a part of salvation. He clearly understood here, it's not. These Gentile believers had faith, they believed in Jesus, and their first step of obedience was to get baptized. And I wanna be very clear, though I do not believe baptism is a part of salvation, it is a very important step in our journey of obedience. Baptism is when you're immersed in the baptismal waters, every inch of your body is covered as you identify with Jesus in his death, and when you come back up out in his resurrection, it is a proclamation to the church that you, of an inward change that God has wrought within, within you, of a transformation. And it's a picture of the gospel for those who don't know Christ. Baptism is important. And if you have not been baptized, I highly, highly in, encourage you to do so. It is a step of obedience. But Peter here says, salvation and baptism are not linked together in that baptism is not a part of what saves you. One more passage, Ephesians 2. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. Not by baptism, by grace. The grace of God in Christ. He continues on, raised us up and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. 
For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. He says, there is no work that's added to salvation, not even baptism. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That is it. Jesus is the one who saves us. So now that we've consulted the biblical map, we know Peter cannot be saying baptism is what saves us. So then what do we do with this verse? I'm going to take a stab at it again. And I, I'm going to be honest. I, I, as I have wrestled with this, I can't find people who agree with me. That's okay because it doesn't affect any major doctrine. It doesn't take away from the gospel. And so here's my stab at what Peter is saying. Baptism, the word there in the original language, baptisma, it means immersion. It's the same word that's used of immersing one in the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so I think, I could be wrong and I'm okay with that. I think Peter is saying baptism that he's talking about is not the uh, water baptism as we would think of it. But I think it's immersion into Christ. Just as Noah and his family were immersed, surrounded and covered by the ark. So we believers are immersed, surrounded and covered by Jesus and groped in his righteousness as he took the wrath of God for us and brings us, so to speak, through the judgment waters. And I believe that in part because he's, he appeals to the resurrection of Jesus. He, some interpretations say that baptism now saves you is a picture of the salvation we've got. But that's not what Peter says. Peter says, Peter says, baptism saves you. Jesus is the only one who saves. So my interpretation is immersion into Christ is what saves us. And a lot of theology from Ephesians informs my view on this because over and again, in the first three chapters of Ephesians, we're told you are in Christ. So I encourage you again, go home and wrestle through these things for yourself. It is a difficult passage, but I encourage you to wrestle with your father and with a trusted brother or sister. The last thing I want us to see is that Jesus reigns. Look at verse 22. Jesus, he's resurrected. He's conquered death, Satan, sin. And he goes, it says, who has gone into heaven is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, powers having been subjected to him. I love this. This is King Jesus on the throne. The right hand of God is a place of majesty, of power, of authority. And Jesus is sitting there ruling and reigning. And even angels, beings that you and I have no power over, are subjected to him. Think about what this meant to the people in first century Rome who had, who had rulers, who had people reigning over their life, but were evil and sadistic and awful. Peter is pulling their gaze up out of their current circumstance to King Jesus, who's on the throne, orchestrating even their suffering according to his will for his glory and their good. And in the midst of their suffering, it would have been easy to, to feel like, well, God has forsaken us. God is against us. But Peter calls their eyes up and says, no, Jesus is in control. He's on the throne. He has not forsaken you. He's using all things together for your good and his glory. And he has never given up control. He's calling their gaze upward. And I think you and I, I think we need the same side adjustment. Because I think subtly, the belief that Jesus has lost his reign has subtly kind of crept into the church. And here's how I hear it. When I hear statements like, well, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Or they took God out of the government. They took God out of school. And I'm not saying that there aren't real issues, societal issues that need to be dealt with. But what I am saying is who gets to tell King Jesus where he gets to go and does not get to go? No one gets to say, oops, Jesus, you crossed the boundary. You can't come into school. They took prayer out of school and they took prayer out of the government. But no one tells King Jesus where he goes. Jesus is on the throne. He's ruling and reigning today, which means we don't have to live in fear. And again, I'm not saying we shouldn't deal with societal problems, but I think that that subtle belief that Jesus has lost his power has crept in because the world doesn't look like it used to, where prayer was more a part of things in the government and in the schools. Jesus has not given up his reign. Jesus has not given up control. I mean, Nero tried to squash the movement of Jesus. What happened? Rome eventually becomes a Christianized nation because of the gospel moving forward. No one can constrain Christ, which means you and I, in the times we currently live, we don't have to live in fear. Jesus is on the throne. 
He's ruling and reigning today. And you can adjust your sight from what's going on in the world to King Jesus and trust him when this world doesn't make sense. I'm going to release to the campuses. I love you guys. Have a good Sunday. Thank you so much for sticking around. It it was really a joy to wrestle through this passage and then to be able to share with you what God has placed on my heart. I hope you will do the same. I hope you will take this seriously. Go home and wrestle through this passage yourself. Or or if you're already home, wrestle right now. And so I just want to throw a couple challenges your way that we can begin to live in light of what Peter said in this passage. As Peter proclaims that Jesus is ruling and reigning, even over angels, authorities, and powers. I want, to, I want you to evaluate. Have you begun to believe Jesus is no longer reigning? Have you begun to live in fear of what's going on in the world? God is in control, even when it seems the world is out of control. The second challenge is, uh, this is an important question to evaluate, but awareness isn't the end of the road. Once you're aware of whether or not you're believing Jesus has lost his rule, what are you going to do with that? So the second question is, how will you replace that lie with the truth? Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you that you are a good God who is in control and that you love us. And God, the world doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense in first century Rome. Your believers would have been understandably complex or perplexed rather. And I pray God that when the world doesn't make sense, we trust that you are on the throne ruling and reigning even when we can't see it. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again so much for joining us. I love you guys. Have a good day.